Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Poets Respond Live. It's uh, Sunday, June 7th. Hope you're having a good weekend. Um, Poets Respond Live is the only Sunday morning news show discussing current events through the lens of poetry. Um, and this is pretty much an open mic. So if you are interested in joining in, all you have to do is uh, give us a call at 818-850-7727. Uh, or send me a chat message over Skype to Rattle Poetry, all one word. And um, I will call you back when the time is right if you'd like to share a poem. Um, if you uh, submitted it to Poets Respond, I can show it on screen as you read, although I should note that you won't be able to see it over Skype. Uh, you'll have to have your own copy in your hand or on your phone to read from. But um, I'll show it on the screen as you um, read the poem so everybody can read along with you. If you if you don't uh, if you didn't submit it to Poet Respond though, um, you can send it to Open Mic all one word Open Mic and, and that's M I C at rattle dot com, and I can pull it up on email. Try to use a file attachment and don't include your contact info in the file. I will try not to show you know I try not to show any contact info on the screen, but if it's sneaking in a footer or something, it's sometimes it's hard to uh, notice until you get there. So don't include your contact info in the file if you send the poem that way. Um, so we always like to start out, and we have a bunch of people uh, already lined up to go. Uh, uh, James Reagan asked uh, to, to be on. Uh, Caitlin Buxbaum, Angela Gartner, someone from a 203 number is calling. So if you call in by phone, um, just let it ring a few times, and it will appear on my call screen. And um, that's how we'll do that. So um, let's see. Now, this weekend, we published uh, two poems, and, and it was a, um, you know, of course, a really big week for news, and um, a lot of things happened. Um, a lot of things are sort of spiraling right now, and um, those really showed up in the submissions. We had over 500, over 600, I think, again, um, which is just a lot to, to read in, uh, every every week, and we picked these two poems. Um, the first one was Prince Bush, middle of protesting. And one of the things um, that, that Poets Respond was always supposed to be from the start was a way to use poetry as sort of journalism. And um, I thought Prince Bush did an amazing job of that with this poem, Middle of Protesting, with a poem from the middle of protesting um, at uh, J. Piercy Priest Dam um, in, I think that's in Nashville, Tennessee, where he is. Uh, I didn't look that up. But uh, here he is. This is um, Prince Bush, reading middle of protesting. Middle of protesting. It's kind of Hang on. Got to fix my sound settings here. It's early. Okay, here we go. We'll try it again. This is middle of protesting. Middle of protesting. It's curfew near J. Percy Priest. Damn. And the tear gas butchers cracks down the convicts close to cresting due to thermal stress. My eyes kindle with milk coolant. All I need is regard to water. The hurts polysyllabic, so I call them CN and CS gases for short. The second of which forces my eyes closed. Solution, make me want to breathe for five minutes and I'll open them. I tell the state I'm going home, but I forgot I'd need a detour with all the bridges I knew broken and reconstructed with brown violence, tanks through the welts on my torso, brown violet, vice versa. If I sting a red onion with a knife, pickle it with household vinegar or acetic acid, that would cause tears and lacrimators would esteem the complex, thus, I attempt eating opposite ingredients with the fork, table, and chair melting. I've yet to find a reusable mask, and now it needs a charcoal filter. The things thrown at me first organic, then synthetic solid, liquid, and fog. That was Prince Bush reading Middle of Protesting. And I just love that ending, too. The, the things thrown at me first organic, then synthetic, liquid, and fog. 
So that was the um, Saturday's poem. Um, and then we did something a little unusual um, for today. There were uh, David Hernandez, a poet from Long Beach, California. We've published him before. Um, he's been writing all week these um, landscape poems, apparently. And he submitted a, a few of them. We, we published two of these um, side by side, which is, I don't think we've ever done that for Poets Respond before. But um, he didn't want to include audio. Um, so I'll just read them for him. But here are these two really just, just – these are just great poems on their own. Um, in any right, but they capture the moment right here. So these are the two uh, poems by David Hernandez. First is Landscape with Protesters on one side, Police on the other, a pasture in between. And in the middle of the pasture, this colossal haystack, three stories high, I'd estimate, if we compare its size to either group and paint it at such an angle that we can see only one circular end the tightly wound wheat and fine spirals of goldenrod and ochre that gradually turns a pale lemon the closer it reaches the upper rim where the sun hits it. But what's that black butterfly shape in the center of the haystack? Some have argued that it is simply a butterfly, nothing else, but I have never seen one with wings like that, in person or pixels or print. It's obvious what it is. You only have to close the space between you and the canvas to see, yes, these are sneaker bottoms. These are treads, patterns that don't exist in nature. This is man-made. There must be a person, a body, still wearing these shoes or else they'd fall to the ground. A body rolled inside a haystack is what we're looking at. A body, one side placed in there, in a place we've been before. A place we keep coming back to over and over and over and over the haystack rolls, pulling our world out from under us. That was poem number one from uh, David Hernandez, Landscape with Protesters on One Side, Police on the Other, A Pasture in Between. And then its companion poem here, Landscape with Abandoned Picnic in Flames. The checkered blanket is on fire, the wicker blanket basket is on fire, and the grass, and the elm tree, and that other elm tree further back whose trunk is swaddled in fluorescent orange, yellow that is almost white, the shade below the leafy branches replaced with blazing. How did this happen, you might ask, since the artist isn't here to say? But don't we know already, given the artist is American, given the year we're living in, oh, the year we're living in, always in the foreground of my mind, the slow unraveling, these familiar flames. The wooden table is on fire, and that vehicle pluming in the background as the painting continues to burn, drips and blisters, and together we watch from a good distance. We step back and step back as the wall from which the painting hangs blackens, as the conflagration takes over, and we move again out of the exhibit, out into the public, seemingly safe. And those were two from David Hernandez. Um, and he wrote, just wrote both of these poems are in response to the national protests surrounding the murder of George Floyd by a Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis police officer. Um, and you can check out his work, of course, at um, David Hernandez, David A. Hernandez dot com. And if you go there, that's what you see today. Now, um, let's move over to the open lines. But, um, but I wanted to thank both um, Prince and David for sharing those two poems this week. Um, now, if we go over to the open mind, let's do um, Angela Gartner first. Uh, then we have a 203 number, a 650, a, uh, and another 203. So two 203 numbers. I don't know where that is, but we got two of them. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Let me, we'll do the six. Yeah, so for Angela Gartner, she asked, um, let me just reply. Yeah, if you um, if you have text you want me to show, um, send it to openmic at rattle.com again, all one word. And um, I'll see if she's done that. Yep, she did that already. Okay, so let's call um, Angela Gartner up. And her poem was Break the Glass. Hey, Angela. Yeah, just shut off your uh, stream so um, there's no, because there's a delay, so it'll be confusing. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. 
<laughs> okay. Hello, hello, how are you doing today? And where are you calling from? Uh, that's right. I remember you called in a couple weeks ago, maybe. Um, and your poem this week is Break the Glass. Is there anything um, that you wanted to say about it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a response to what has been going on this week, the protests. And, you know, I was I was thinking about the play that I recently read, which is The Doll's House by Her Hen Hendrik Isbin. Um, I'm probably saying his name wrong. I apologize. But it's it's where like she breaks out of her shell um, <laughs> because her, you know, it's, it's, she's kind of trapped in the dollhouse. Like she, it's kind of um, something that it's like almost like a metaphor. So it's, it's definitely, I feel like we're all kind of trapped in our little bubbles and, you know, we need to start to break the glass and, you know, these kind of events kind of makes you, you know, think about what you can do personally to help other people. So mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great point. Okay, well, it's, it's on screen for everybody to read, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, I sent you just the new. Yeah, I have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. From the, yeah, from, uh, from openmicatrattle.com, you sent it. Okay. Um, we live in our glass houses, safely inside, looking through the mullion windows, eating macaroons from a baggie with a tie. We look down at the device that controls our life, our silence is deafening. The truth is seen by a tap of a screen. Our walls break. Shattered pieces are sewn on the street. It's not enough to just think about peace. We can't breathe along with those in agony. The world has plunged into darkness. We step outside, fists clenched. We have to do something. People who don't understand the pain rage incomprehensibly with their tired theories. We are ready for the fight. What is our place? How can we help break this cycle of hate? Glass walls never last. It's time for us to act. Excellent call to action. Thanks so much for sharing that. And that was um, Angela Gartner reading uh, her poem, Break the Glass. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for calling in and sharing that, Angela. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Okay, let's see. Um, let me see if um, I have to find um, let's see. So James Ragan is um really well known poet and uh, he's going to be the guest on the Rattlecast on uh, August 4th. And he um, said he would like to share a poem from his new book, um, which he sort of modified, I think, for, for this, uh, for, for, to make it more fit, Poets Respond. Let's see uh, if we can call him up if he's live. Um, okay, let's try this. I have his poem here. This is Rage by James Reagan. Um, let's see if it works. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message after the beep. Let's see. Well, that didn't work. Let me try one more time. There's two... <clears throat> I'm trying to find his book here. Let's see. Jim, are you there? Yes, I'm here. How are you, Tim? I'm great. How are you? Um, you don't have your camera on if you'd like to turn. There it comes. All right. Hello. How how you doing? It's great to see you. I haven't well, seen you in a very long time. I think it's you mentioned it. I think it was uh, uh, when they did the documentary uh, premiere. Yeah, yeah. For instance, they did on my life. That was the last time. Yeah. So, so James Reagan was the director of the um, uh, MFA program or MPW program at USC, um, where I went about I don't know, fifteen, twelve years ago or something like that. Um, yeah. He's also the author of a, a bunch of great books, including the most recent, which is um, the uh, what, what was it called, the Canticle? 
the chanters read. The chanters uh, read is the for, for the bagpipes, the bagpiper. It's what he blows into for to uh, to restore the passion into the uh, bagpipes with the voice and the and the passion that the bagpipes give. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then this poem that you, you wanted to share today is um, from that book, but modified, as I understand it? Yes. Yes. I had written, uh, the original was for the 17 um, uh, young students and the teacher that were killed at Parkland High School several years ago. Mm, yeah, yeah. I had written it for them uh, because it was the same response that I had this time with the uh, George Floyd uh, killing. And back then, uh, the idea was to have people understand the need to join in a communal voice. So they had me fly down to Sarasota into that area. And some of the people came up who were involved, uh, parents and others came up for that. And I gave a reading and, and uh, read that poem as a dedication to those students. So what I did was having the same words pretty much with a few changed um, realized that this was uh, similar in so many ways. The culture of violence we've come to normalize, or at least we, as a white society, seem to want to normalize to somehow, uh, you know, be rid of our guilt in so much of this mm-hmm. that we see. Uh, so I, I just rewrote a few words into it and dedicated it to George Floyd and all of the innocents so many of the innocents that have been lost to us recently and through the decades to uh, uh, racist uh, malice. And so that that poem became Rage, which was the original title also in the book, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, well, thanks so much for sharing it with us today. Um, It's it's on screen for everybody to see if you want to read it. I would love to do that. It's entitled Rage. And again, I dedicate this to uh, George Floyd and the other innocents lost to us by racist malice. That's an epigraph for the poem. All day, I waited for breath to climb onto the tongue. Not easily, some might say, with a gasping stutter, sliding down the throat's spined rib to find the word that refuses to be spoken. Its silence wrapped like shade in the lungs bowl of darkness. What could I know of nuance, its shape or sound? Elusive, like the scent of hatred, neither giving nor forgiving. How in moments of light when love might have gardened the heart, a life fades amid the dying roots of breath. I would sooner reach out to a crow's beak or climb a steeple and believe as many do in the height and point of things. How in merciful times a syllable's utterance of guilt might suffice. All day I've wondered, what in time is too long a time to kneel before a flowered grave until a death is honored? What in time is too silent a word to ban the triggered power that breeds contempt for a generation's grief. For days I've wandered, searching the riddle of letters for any assemblage of sounds I could justify, for an instance of repentance, for any gift of redemption I could set free from the depths of world pity. In a word, enough is not word enough the silence, the rage, sorrowed in this song. Thanks so much. That was James Ragan reading Rage from um, his newest book, um, The Chanters Read, which I found now from my stack of books. So you can see it on the screen here, The Chanters Read by James Ragan from Salmon Poetry, which just came out. Um, and, and like I mentioned, James uh, will be the guest on uh, Rattlecast number, I don't know if it's like 58 or I don't know what it is, 70-something, August 4th. We'll see you again, Jim. Thanks so much for calling in and sharing that poem with us. I congratulate you on all the good work you're doing with these uh, venues of communication. Thank you. Oh, it's just, it's my pleasure. These are really fun to do, and um, I'm so glad you could join us, and, and looking forward to seeing you in August.
I look forward to it also. Okay. Have a great rest of your weekend. You too. Bye. Okay, yeah, so it's James Reagan uh, with Rage. And now, um, let me see. Who else on this? We have Richard Westheimer, um, Chris Kleinfelter. Um, uh, we have a bunch of phone numbers. So let me just say one more time, um, if you would like to call in and join us, um, that number uh, to call is 818-850-7727, or you can send me a chat message over Skype, all one word, to Rattle Poetry. Let's do one of these phone numbers and see who we have. We will call this a 650 number. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Six five. Oh. Well, that one didn't work. Let's try. Whoever was at the six five zero number, uh, I'll try again in a little bit. Let's go for the two eight one. It's ringing now. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem with us today? Yes, Tim. It's Kathy Gibbons calling from Houston. Ah, and Kathy. Good to, good to hear from you. Thanks so much for calling in. Yes, um, this is a poem I submitted last week. Okay, let me pull it up. Uh, and then we would... Okay, yeah, let me just uh, find it for everybody so they can read along. Um, yeah, here we go. I have it. So um, is there anything you wanted to say about it to introduce it? I just was thinking about knees in general and their functions and capabilities. So, and I dedicated it to George Floyd and also to Larry Kramer, who had died last week as well, the AIDS activist. Mm-hmm. And um, I start with a, uh, a little fact about the patellar reflex. The normal knee jerk or patellar jerk reflex is elicited when the knee is tapped below the kneecap, the patella. Sensors then detect stretching of the tendon of this area and send electrical impulses back to the spinal cord. The brain is never involved in the reflex. And so... Kneecap elegy, to flex, to overextend, to genuflect perhaps, a gesture meant to honor, a joint to bend, as if entering a pew, to view and pray unto your God, not quite like Colin Kaepernick, whose bent knee is meant to have us reflect upon the cruelty, disparity, division, and how separately we seem to live our lives, not equally, by the way. And now another knee, like middle finger, extended infinitely, like noose, like guillotine, like guilty conscience, sent by dying greed to see another die instead. To staunch, to stop, to stand your ground, assert your preferential status. And you had to take George Floyd with you, a statement that you're going down, but not with ship. You'll take another man instead, a man who scares you for some reason you cannot admit your fear, and so you kneel in domination, not in prayer, but supplication, that you still are number one, under the gun, but only there. Thanks so much. That was Kathy Gibbons reading Kneecap Elegy. Uh, Kathy Gibbons from Houston, Texas. Thanks so much for joining us, Kathy. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Yeah, bye. Okay, let's see. Um... Let's call it Caitlin Buxbaum. Oops. Hey, Caitlin. Hey, sorry, I always <laughs> do because I have like eight tabs open. No, it's all right. Um, it's all right. You got a good connection as always. I'm calling from uh, somewhere in Alaska. I can't ever remember exactly where. Yep, good old Sarah Palin town. Oh, that's right, the Wasilla. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, how are things in Alaska today? Well, um, we actually had a protest yesterday in the next town over mm -hmm. um, after some. So the the Palm, Palmer is right next to Wasilla. The Palmer police chief um, 
had made some comments on Facebook a couple years ago that came up in all this, and people were pretty upset about it. So I just went um, with my reporter hat on, so to speak. Um, I wasn't sure how I wanted to participate, so the night before, I just decided I'm going to go there and take pictures and talk to people and see what happens. So it was good. It was very, I think... um, a very successful mm-hmm. event. Yeah, that's good. And safe. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, is it a small town? How many people are in Wasilla? Um, <laughs> hard to say. <laughs> so the boundaries for Wasilla and Palmer are actually very small mm-hmm. compared to the number of people that say, I'm from Wasilla, I'm from Palmer. Um, so Wasilla proper, I think they say is like less than 10,000. But I would say probably 20,000 call Wasilla home. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the protest, we had a few people from Anchorage come out. Um, they had, they've had a couple protests too. Um, and, but it was hard to get a good gauge because I, you know, when you're in the crowd, you can't really see all the, cause they had people like raise their hands if they came from Anchorage. But, um, I took a video of the whole March going by, um, on one of the sidewalks and counted like over 900 people. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Uh, hmm. it, was, it was a much bigger turnout than they were expecting. Yeah, that's what so. I'm wondering about because we have a, one in our small town um, t- this afternoon. And, um, you know, last time when we were protesting before, it was um, usually um, the Iraq War and, and um, things like that. Um, and there'd be like five people, um, you know, by the post office with signs. So I'm really wondering, it seems like a lot more people are going to show up than, um, than did for that um, back in the day. Um, anyway, so so what poem did you want to read today? Um, the one I submitted this week, it was an erasure poem called Insurrection Again. Okay, cool. I have it ready in just one second. Okay. It's ready whenever you are. And is there anything okay, you want to say I'll, about it to start, I should say? Yeah, just like two things. Um, there's There was a footnote just to indicate that it was an erasure poem and that I used a 2017 um, NPR article called When L.A. Erupted in Anger, A Look Back at the Rodney King Riots, um, which that happened, you know, 1992 was the year I was born. So <laughs> I didn't know a lot um, from personal experience. So I was as I was looking up stuff on the Insurrection Act, as that was in the news last week, um, I came across this article and was just kind of stunned by the similarities so um yeah i guess that's all i'll say about it okay insurrection again looters fire a police department guilty white savage caught on camera the attack was broadcast worldwide Fury, stoked by years of inequality, spilled into five days of rioting, ignited a national conversation that has to be repeated today. It is criminal, this thing we call justice and law. Ocular proof seemed compelling, yet they told us we couldn't trust our lying eyes. A black year under the influence of office and minutes. More cops stood by, watching. Fractures, broken bones, permanent damage. Excessive use of force. Later, a jury found four officers not guilty. The unrest began. Residents set fires, looted, and destroyed liquor stores, grocery stores, retail shops, and fast food restaurants. Silence was violent. Still is. Tension had already been mounting. The unemployment rate was high, ravaging the area. Another contributing factor, the same spring, shot and killed several African Americans. The accused? Fine. The incident intensified the system. Anger was deepening against police. African Americans did not feel protected, reported being harassed without cause. An occupying force, biased against people of color and civil rights, was aggressive, policing with abusive power. An open campaign to suppress and contain didn't distinguish between a suspected criminal and African Americans driving nice cars. The riots began at an intersection of news reports and first-hand accounts. 
That first night, the cops drove right by without stopping. Strangers, viciously rioting, started coming in. Police were not deployed immediately. The chief announced the city was not ag- adequately prepared. There was no official plan for social unrest on that scale. The most astounding thing is, that night repeated itself. On June 1st, the third day of the riots, people don't just want to say, can we all get along? Can we get along? People want results. During five days of unrest, there are more deaths. More people injured, alleged looters, and arsonists arrested. A curfew announced. The National Guard deployed. More buildings damaged or destroyed. And what of the four officers charged? Slowly, residents will return to their everyday routines, but social issues will not be resolved. That video, just another in a long line of brutal videos to go viral. Issues such as racial profiling are as evident now as they were in 1992 Los Angeles. Ain't nothing changed but the year it is. And that was uh, Caitlin Buxbaum reading Insurrection again, um, an erasure poem from uh, 1992 uh, from the Los Angeles Times. Thanks for sharing that. It's interesting to look back. I was 12 in 1992. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that is sort of the a, a big turning point where um, we had this this crap that went on forever on video. So you, it couldn't be denied, you know, and now and now we get it on video all the time, unfortunately, or well, fortunately, that it's, it's known about. So well, and the two things that really stuck out to me as similarities that really like clinched it for me, I guess, is that in that incident, there were also four officers hmm. involved. Um, and I, I think they were charged, but they got off. And so even though we have had these officers in Minneapolis um, charged, you know, mm-hmm. we still have to wait and see what happens. Um, and then that line uh, where I said on June 1st, I just replaced may with june because you know one month later Mm -hmm. it's the same like it had been about the same number of days and it was just like whoa (laughs) (laughs) um and also uh, just another quick thing is just i used a lot of brackets to add some words usually when i do erasure poems i don't like to do that but because i was kind of trying to make these similarities between the two events i felt like it was necessary, but mm-hmm. anyway, this one's still a work in progress too, I guess, as they all are. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, well, uh, thanks so much, sharing. And and you're going to be on with Jimmy Pappas later today. Is that what you said in the in the message? Yeah, actually, uh, in half an hour. So I I hope I'm ready for that. <laughs> um, he has a group called uh, Let's see, Poets Society of New Hampshire mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, and usually they'd meet in person, but since they're not, um, they're doing a lot of different things. And so he invited me to read some poems from my book, um, and talk about, talk about them. So we'll, well how, how can see people, how, uh, how can people find that if they, um, you want to go there after they pop over here? So I think it's a private event, uh, um, okay. like an invite only kind of thing. Gotcha. So that's why I was kind of hesitant to mention it, but, uh, um, I see. But he has, they have a website, I think, um, if, you, if people search Poets Society of New Hampshire, mm-hmm. they should be able to find it and, and can reach out to him and and ask about okay, it. Okay, well, do that really quick, because so. it's happening in uh, 20 minutes or so. But uh, yeah. so break a leg. Have a good, <laughs> I think I'm ready. Yeah, have a good one, Caitlin. Good to, Great, good to see you. Bye. Yeah, see ya. Okay. Um, let's do... Um, Eileen Casanetto. I'm sure they should be able to... Hey, Eileen, this is Tim. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? And hello. Uh, yeah, sorry. let me pull you... Oh. Turn off yeah, turn off your other stream so there's just the one. Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. Um, and where are you calling from? Um, San Mateo County. Oh, okay. North California. Um, and let me try to find it. Did you submit? Did you uh, submit the poem you wanted to read? I, called um, Gazel for George. Ah, I, I found it already. Okay, cool. Um, is there anything you want to say about it before? Uh... Yes. Um, so I wrote this poem um, on the eve of um, George Floyd's memorial, and it's in the form of a um, Gazel, not only to hold my sorrow, but also to transcend horror and uh, tragedy and inhumanity. Uh, 
So here goes. Okay. God's love for George. Minneapolis's older city was lost that night. Not even the saint of lost things could find it that night. You left your home too. You had nowhere else to go to, save for the city, which went down in flames that night. I had a dollar and it was my last one too. What should we have for dinner tonight? What else is there but water and mother, being and life-giving, true thing on this wild night? We can transcribe a scene for eight minutes, make it matter. Instead, we held our breath for half a minute before we gasped that night. We have mastered the coincidence of once, haunt want, taunt want, want want, and went hungry that night, all day long just wanting to get through the night. This body that is built on the power of water, of grist, of Floyd, this air, this ground, this black matter will arise again tonight. Thank you so much, Tim, for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks so much. That was Gazelle for George by um, Eileen Castaneto uh, from uh, San Mateo, California. Thanks so much for sharing that and calling in, Eileen. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's do another one of these phone numbers. Let's do... Hmm. Let's try this 650 number. Give them a chance again. Automatic. <laughs> nope, still didn't work. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's do uh, Richard Westheimer. I don't think he's been on in a little while. Well, the phone's ringing. Ah, hello, Richard. Good to see you. Let me play hey, it Tim. in. How are you doing today? Well, pretty well. I mean, there's a lot, a lot going on, a lot occupying our minds besides the 90 degree, degree weather. Yeah, it's cold here. It's uh, actually we woke up. I don't think I don't think you can see my breath, but um, yeah. but it's close. I got my I'm all huddled in my hoodie here. Right. Um, up in the mountains of Southern California, but um, yeah, so much going on. Uh, what what poem did you want to share today? Um, I sent uh, by email um, mm -hmm. dealing with squirrels and other awakening. Yeah, okay, I have it here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and is there anything you want to say about it before? We yeah, start? real quick. It, you know, trying to find one's voice when it's not your voice that's important is kind of difficult. Um, trying to find a voice when you don't want to appropriate other folks' experience um, is difficult. So, you know, I, there's a lot of um, uh, people who look like me are sort of uh, rending their clothes and pulling their hair and sort of imagining that, um, like, this oppression is theirs, which is not necessarily a bad thing in the long run to sort of own it. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I felt a real sense that uh, um, this isn't the time for me to own that particular experience. Mm -hmm. So I sort of looked for what my experience was in terms of sort of not necessarily good choices that I always make. Mm -hmm. um, so dealing with squirrels and other awakenings. One, the squirrel invasion is upon us, brought on by our good intentions feeding the birds this summer. Now the greedy bastards have found the ripening strawberries I too covet. I pull out my 22 and ponder the trade-offs. Two, one coyote minus one coyote equals one coyote. I saw a big one in uh, by the creek and called the good old boy who hunts my woods. He loves the peace out here more than I do. He said he'd bring his AR and take the sucker down with one shot. 
a small price to pay for a walk in the woods. Three, Barr says he didn't give tactical order to clear Pochester's. When the commander pulls out his long gun, fingers the trigger, squints down its sight and walks off, the men know what to do. This time they attack my kin who look like my children. What else might make me feel your pain? Thanks so much. That was Richard Westheimer uh, reading Dealing with Squirrels and Other Awakenings. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Richard. I always appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Bye. Bye. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Who else should we do? Let's do uh, Dan Hanrahan. <clears throat> Okay, let's see. Hey, Dan, um, I think you have your uh, background, you know, the stream on another place, too, maybe. I heard myself for a second. Yeah. That is, yeah, okay. So uh, you are you are live. Um, hello, where are you calling from? Oh, we lost your video for a second. Okay. Now we got you back. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Dan? place too maybe oh, okay. I heard myself for a second um i think I that's think the that's, uh, yeah. oh, okay that is yeah okay so uh, there, there's a big are... let's see i'm kind of confused here there's a bit of an echo I hope you lost your video. yeah so so you're listening to me behind i'm sorry i gotta hang up on you maybe um yeah it just gets too confusing but, but apparently the delay's not that long so that was a little strange maybe i will um We'll try Dan again in a minute. Let's do, uh, try to figure out um, which phone number. It's hard to keep track of which phone number I um, have done and have not. Let's see, 203. I think it's 203 we haven't done yet. So for Dan, I'm not sure what's happening, but I think you weren't getting the sound except for through the YouTube video. And um, I'm not sure how to fix that. Hello, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem for uh, Poet Respond Live? Yes, absolutely. My All my technology died, so I can only use my cell phone. I couldn't, like, you know, Skype you. So, yeah, I would love it. I okay, did cool. submit a poem. And who am, I, who am I talking to, first of all? This is Holly Russell. Holly Russell. Hey, good to hear from you. Let me try to find your poem. And where are you calling from? Uh, Darianne, Connecticut. Oh, okay. And um, and what was your poem about? Just to, is there anything you want to say to introduce it as I pull it up? Yeah, no. I um, I read a Wall Street Journal article about Minneapolis explaining the deep-rooted issues in the police department. And in the middle of the article, there was an interview with two gentlemen in a neighborhood near the riots. And what they said really resonated with me and prompt me to write the poem. And just as much was the photograph that was taken by Aaron Aylworth for Wall Street Journal of these two men sitting in their lawn chairs with the riots going on nearby. And I was just really struck by what they said and by the photograph, and it inspired me to write the poem. Okay, great. I tried to put the photograph, but I don't have a Wall Street Journal subscription, so I couldn't show everybody. Oh, I know. I, but, I um, had to like get my brothers and like, like <laughs> around to get it. Yeah. But but I have the poem, so I'm I'm curious to hear this because um, I I don't know what the picture is. So um, go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Um, I I can try and send you a copy of the photo later if you want. Okay. Yeah. Sure. But I would love that. Okay. I'll see if I can fudge that around. The poem is called Two Men in Lawn Chairs. Two men in lawn chairs sit in the yard, in a neighborhood, in the Sunday sun, discussing this and that, including the rioting blocks away. Ignited shops, crackling dumpsters, the third precinct lit in a sheet of orange, one man has lowered his disposable mask, which wraps under his chin. The other wears an anchor pendant hanging on a chain. People are angry. I don't blame them. 
stuff's replaceable, but a life, that's forever. The virus set a torch to another virus, banked before flaring yet again to rip through the crowd. The dis-ease has claimed more than shops and precincts, more than libraries, boutiques, and city halls. The lives it has taken go black and black. We're all in this, America, up to our gasping throats. This poem is for the sweepers, emerging in the morning with bandanas and buckets and brooms to clear away the debris. It's for the mayors and mothers, the spritzers wiping away tear gas, the cops walking with or taking a knee. It's for handers out of snacks and bottles water, bottled water. It's for protesters raising voices and pizza box signs to be heard. A voice has no color. It's clear, the heart of the flame, an invisible, audible beacon going up in a whoosh of pain, rage, for change. How else do you speak in such a situation except with tongues of fire? The men in the sun in the chairs hear it, their wisdom earned from lives and eyes that have seen truths and shadows arriving them at this place of understanding. Thanks so much. That was um, Holly Russell from Darien, Connecticut, reading Two Men in Lawn Chairs. I'll have to go look up that photo from the Wall Street Journal. But thanks. That's one of the neat things about um, Poets Respond is picking out little details of of news stories and, and highlighting them more than the news does. So thanks so much for sharing that, Holly. Thank you for the honor of letting me read it. I appreciate it very oh, my, much. My, my pleasure. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Okay, let's try. Uh, Dan gave me his phone number, so I'm going to try calling him instead on the phone. And maybe that'll work. This is Dan Hanrahan. Hello, this is Dan. Hey, Dan, it's Tim with Rattle. Um, you're on just on audio now, but uh, we can hear you, so that's that's much better than how it was working out before. Okay, that's great. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. And where are you calling from? Chicago, Illinois. Okay, great. And um, and what did you submit? Uh, did you did you submit the poem that you wanted to read, or did you email it or anything? No, I I just have a printout here. Okay. Um, well, so so I can't show it, but just read it, I guess, okay. and um, we'll all listen. Okay. okay. Um, it's called Minneapolis 2020, America Makes Monsters. Um, Native American writer Jack Forbes has a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals. And it describes how particularly some Native American people in the Midwest, including the Winnebago, who are not far from Minneapolis, have a word called Wendingo, or sometimes Wetico. And it's a word that was used to describe what they saw as many of the European settlers were coming into the Midwest, um, and it means a, a spiritual cannibal. They, they were really puzzled by some of the behavior they were seeing, yet they had a spirit in some of their mythology that was the figure of a, a cannibal spirit that was kind of the idea of a hungry ghost. Um, so with that in mind, maybe that, that might have influenced some of this. Minneapolis 2020, America Makes Monsters. A man gone, a city broken on a bright day in late May because America makes monsters. Mississippis of broken hearts float downstream. You can see them from the bridge that crosses to St. Paul, trailing flecks of blood because America makes monsters. I hear the bells from the cathedral. They sound like dread news, like packs of timber wolves howling in the Midwestern dusk, because America makes monsters. These cops serve an angry God with wild eyes burning, 1,000 funeral pyres in a Minnetonka sunset, because America makes monsters. Rush Hannity, Savage Beck, Garbage DJ, Incinerator Hymns, Turn Men Into Swine, burst forth ill winds into the ears of desperate men because America makes monsters. To unmake a monster, you must take out its teeth and pull out its claws. We're learning. 
in the sunset, in the moonlight, in the twilight, on the streets, to unmake a monster. Thanks so much. That was Dan Hanrahan reading um, um, To Make a Monster. Is that what it was called? Uh, to Unmake a Monster. To Unmake a Monster. And what was that word again that you said at the beginning? That um, the, the word for the, yeah, the spiritual answers, cannibal? I've seen it, yeah, I've seen it rendered two ways in English. The most common way is Wetiko, W-E-T-I-K-O. And sometimes I've seen it rendered Windigo, W-I-N-D-I-G-O. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I never heard that before, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that poem. I yeah, love the yeah, refrain in there too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good one. Thanks for calling in. Bye. Bye. Okay. Let me see. Three minutes. I'm trying to see who else. Hey, let me do. We have. A, I think. I think this might be the last one we have in the queue. Um, it's the 203 number. Hello? Hey, oh, is this Celine Mariotti? Yes, it is. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Doing fine. So, um, what did you want to read today? Was it, um, Nothing New Under the Sun? Nothing New Under the Sun, yeah. Okay, let me um, let me pull it up. I, I got it ready. Um, okay. Is there anything you wanted to say about it, or um, and you're calling uh, just, from you know, uh, that, you know the where the world is and uh, today it's, it's it's never it's never changed. And a teacher I had in high school always told us that there's nothing new under the sun because you know there's always been good and bad people throughout time, ancient days, medieval days, and and it seems that you know nothing changes because mm-hmm. people don't change, and it's just the way of the world. Yeah, I but went through a phone. yeah, I went through a phase of reading um, Roman history a couple years ago, and um, I just could not believe how similar Rome was to to our republic here, and, and you know the human nature is, really doesn't change in thousands of years, unfortunately. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have it ready. On nothing new under the sun. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Already, nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. My high school teacher, Mrs. Anderson, taught us in her creative writing course. I love that class as I love to write and always have. Mrs. Anderson said the way people were in ancient times, in the medieval times, in the 1800s, and now in modern times, that's the way people always have been. They've always been jealous, manipulative, gossipy, small-minded, petty, prejudiced. But there have always been good people, too. Kind, loving, good-hearted, easygoing folks who share and always help out. That's the way the world has always been. And the writers of their times wrote about the world they lived in. Homer wrote about it. Serrano de Bergerac wrote about his times. Henry David Thoreau, Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, Alexander Dumas, Jules Verne, Leo Tolstoy, Louisa May Alcott, Charlotte Bronte, Ernest Hemingway, Jane Bronte, Daniel Steele, John Jakes, Louise Penny, Earl Stanley Gardner, Ian Fleming, Robert Parker, and many, many more writers throughout the ages. And of course, moi. Yes, me, Celine. I write stories for children, but I also write mysteries, and I always have characters who mirror the human soul, good, bad, and somewhere in between, and sometimes, yes, humorous and downright adorable. Thanks so much. That was Celine Mariotti uh, reading her poem from this week, Nothing New Under the Sun. Uh, Thanks for calling in as always, Celine. Always good to hear from you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, so that was, uh, I think that was the last person we have on the list. So we're actually going to get through everybody by by the hour mark, which is kind of nice for a change. Um, oh, we have another phone call. Let me just take it. Hey, who's this? This is Jonathan Katz. Hey, Jonathan. Good to hear from you. Let me um, let me find your poem. Did you submit a poem you wanted to read? I, I did. And it was, uh, well, I, yes, I did. 
um, it's a short one. Okay. And I, I, when you said there was nobody left in the queue, I thought, well, here's a chance. Yeah, perfect. And I should say, if anybody else is still waiting and, and wants to jump in at the last minute, it's 818-850-7727. So I have fortunes. Is that the poem you wanted to read? Hey, this, this is Jonathan Cat. Oh, I hey, think you Jonathan. still have the... Um, Jonathan, are you there? You still have the, the video or the audio stream ongoing. So turn off your computer. Okay. Yeah, it's a little confusing because of the delay. Right. Yeah, okay. perfect. And I should say, if anybody else is still waiting and, and wants to jump in at the last minute, please. There you go. Okay. So, so was it Fortunes that you wanted to read? Yes. Okay. And is there anything you wanted to say about it? Sure. It's, oh, are we on now? Yeah, we're on now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's no call yeah. screeners or anything. It's just yeah. me, uh, me at my uh, computer desk. So that's all we have. <laughs> Sure. Well, it was, it was just that I'd read this, uh, uh, this, this simple observation in, the, in this uh, um, uh, article about writing for children. And, uh, and it said the, the, the opening quote there, kids can easily write a list poem using the process of observation. And I thought, well, yeah, sure, you can. But the way list poems work is that people bring to them um, an, an enormous amount of context. And the more dramatic the context is, um, the easier it is for a kid to write a poem. That, that, that reads like a poem. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, so I thought, well, let me see if I can be as childlike as possible and describe what's going on this week. Okay, great. Yeah, well, let's hear it. Okay, so this is Fortunes, and that's, that's meant to be a pun. Um, you will be presumed innocent. You can be as good as your teachers expect. If you work hard, you can pay the bills. Your streets will be safe if you keep to yourself. No one will focus on your petty crimes. There will be enough air for everyone. Something bends towards justice. You are the future. A list can easily become a poem. Awesome. That was uh, Fortunes by Jonathan Katz uh, from Sister Coma Park, Maryland. Uh, yeah, That's thanks. Right. Thanks so much for calling in and sharing that. A uh, good list poem, and and the irony is not lost there. <laughs> thanks for the forum. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for calling. Bye. Bye. Okay, so um, let's see. Let me make sure I got to everybody now. One more check through the list. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, it's been a, a great show as always. Always a pleasure to do these every. Sunday morning, a good way, you know, it's 9 a.m. start time here for me, so I get my coffee, and um, it's a good way to, to start the day, sharing some poems with everybody. Um, this is actually the um, first day of three straight days of um, um, live streams. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we have Dorian Lux reading uh, from her new book, Only As the Day Is Long, on um, um, the rattle, Rattlecast number 44. Um, she'll be joining us at 9 p.m. Eastern. That's a Monday. It's an unusual day because we postponed um, last Tuesday's Rattlecast with her. So um, join us for that. And then less than 24 hours later, our Rattlecast number 45. And it's another unusual time. Usually these are Tuesdays at 9 p.m. This is Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Because um, uh, Mark Allen DiMartino, the poet, uh, our guest for uh, Rattlecast number 45, is a poet from Italy. And um, the time zones don't work out unless we do it early. So uh, it's one of the first of our early shows. We're also having Zaina Hashem Beck uh, later in, uh, I don't know if it's the last week in June or the first week in July, but we're having her and we're doing that early too to um, make up for the time zone difference. So we'll see how the turnout is at different times of the day. But you can join us for Rattlecast number 45, uh, Tuesday, June 9th. And then once again, tomorrow night, June 8th, Doria and Lux, a great show. Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. I hope to see you there, and I hope you have a great rest of the day, and everybody stays safe out there. Goodbye.